Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. We will be looking at verses 1 through 13. So quite a few verses. I'm hoping that I can get through it. We're going to look at two healings. And so today's theme is the healings. We're going to look at a leopard who comes to Jesus and he requests to be healed. And we're going to look at a centurion who, who comes to Jesus and requests that his servant be healed. So two different situations of faith where the leopard had to have the faith to come to Jesus and Jesus healed him. And then the centurion had to have the faith for his servant who had no real faith involved there and Jesus healed him. You know, the first step to salvation is always the awareness of one's sinful state. Uh, There's a sense of being dirty of sin. That is really the first step, our depravity. Realizing that I am really a sinful person. I don't love God the way that I'm supposed to. Uh, With all my heart, with all my strength, all my mind, all my body. I I don't keep holy the Sabbath day like I'm supposed to. Uh, I take his name sometimes in in vain. In vain means I make his name worthless. And so I use it as a swear word. Or I'll use his being as a form of my personal expression uh, of worthless, vain things. Or I don't always love my neighbor like I love myself. And so I realize that I fail quite often and that I am a sinner and I've fallen from God's grace and his love and I really don't deserve him. And if I were to ask for justice on anyone else, then I would also receive justice and I would be condemned just as well. And when we realize that, God then can begin to work in our lives. But we have to really keep that at the forefront of our minds that we're dirty and we need to be cleansed. Jesus gives that picture of Peter, right, in the upper room, you know, let me wash your feet, and Peter's like, no, 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 Lord, my, you don't need to wash my feet, don't touch my feet, you know, and Jesus says, hey, I need to wash your feet. I've cleansed you, but you need some cleansing in your life. So after Jesus's very clear details there on the Sermon on the Mount from chapter five through seven, he now moves on to a a fast-moving pace, Uh, in healings and in miracle stories here from chapters 8 to 9. And so we're going to be looking at those two chapters uh, these several weeks uh, from now. And we're going to look at the stories of miracles, that God does have the authority. He has a power uh, to perform miracles and um, healings in the lives of his people. We find here, as Matthew has been presenting Jesus as the king, that this king that is our king, that he does have power. He does have strength. He does have the ability to heal, to forgive, and we can really trust in him for that. When we look at chapter 8 here, verses 1 through 17 show that Jesus is a powerful king, and he came to take our infirmities. He really has, and to heal us. And in verse 17, uh, what he says there is that it's not by, it is might that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying he himself took our infirmities and broke or bore our sicknesses. And then verses 18 through 34 shows his power over uh, nature and the spiritual. Now remember that in chapters 5 through 7, Jesus declared the principles of the kingdom of God, and we really should go back there and learn those principles and how we should, as believers, live by them. But in this chapter 8 through 9, he will show us the evidence of his power to banish sin and control the elements of nature. You know, there is no sin that God cannot forgive. There's no sin that God cannot forgive. God can forgive you of every sin that you have committed. Every sin in your mind, he can wash it away. That's how great his grace is in your life. You can go and sin willfully against God and come back to him and humble yourself, and I mean in true humility, and ask God for forgiveness, and the forgiveness will be there. You can go out and literally kill someone out of anger or rage or frustration, and in true humility, come back, suffering the consequences, ask God for forgiveness, and while you're in prison for the rest of your life, he can really forgive you. There's no sin that he cannot forgive. Um, Don't think or don't believe the lie of Satan when he tries to whisper in your ear that that's too great of a sin for God to forgive. 
and that you're a sinner and that you're worthless and there's no use you continuing to try to follow Jesus because you just continue to fail after fail after fail. No, God can forgive you if you come to him and ask for forgiveness. So remember, Matthew is writing about a king with power. We saw that in chapter one, his ancestry through his genealogy. We saw his incarnation, his birth as a king there. The announcement in chapter three as a king. And also in chapter four, the approval when he was tempted by Satan himself and he proved that he was the king. And then of course, uh, chapters five through seven as he gave his, his uh, constitution as the king. And then we come to uh, chapter 8 through 9 as the king's power. So healings of faith. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. We'll go ahead and read, read those verses just to get the context uh, of what's going on in the life of this leopard. It says, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leopard came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus put his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy, uh, lepers, leopard was cleansed, and Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. We find, in, we find this account here of the leopard in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, the only one that doesn't mention it is John. John's dealing with the deity of Jesus Christ, but the other three deal with it, and they're very similar. There's a couple of differences, but not much. Clearly, this story was widely told to the, to the audience, and there was a purpose and a reason for it. And I believe that the, that the gospel writers of the Synoptic Gospels intention for writing this story of the leper was to authenticate the ministry of Jesus Christ that he didn't just proclaim to be the king he didn't proclaim to be God but he had the power and authority to be God that he could literally heal someone of a disease and a disease that that has never really been healed in over 300 years uh, with the Jewish people they have set up a whole system of cleansing. They've set up a whole system of diagnosing uh, a certain leprosy and skin diseases, but they have never seen uh, the aspect of when a cleansing happens, how they go to a priest, offer up a gift, and, and then they were considered or proclaimed as being clean and acceptable to enter back into society. They had not seen that aspect of it. And yet here's Jesus. He comes along and he does exactly that. He heals a leopard who then goes to the priest, offers up the proper sacrifices according to the law, and now he can enter back into the community. That's a testimony right there. And that's a testimony that, that all of us have today, that we are cleansed from our sins and we can be productive citizens in the kingdom of God. And God accepts us as though we have never sinned. That's what atonement is all about. Jesus atoned for us. He made us righteous by giving us his righteousness. And so we stand before God cleansed as children of God. Every one of us are children of God and we're acceptable to the Lord. Even when we sin, we're acceptable to the Lord. I shared on Wednesday nights and I encourage you to come out on Wednesday nights. We've been doing an overview on the Old Testament. And we hit the first five books. We'll be hitting the, um, the history this coming Wednesday and then hitting the worship and then ending with the major and minor prophets. But I encourage you to come out because it's just a booster shot for the week to just get filled with the Lord, come and worship and come and um, hear his word and get equipped for the work of the, of the ministry. But I was sharing there uh, that Wednesday night, um, how, no, I lost my train of thought, unbelievable, <laughs> how Jacob, there it is, how Jacob's name was changed to Israel, uh, and, and Jacob means supplanter, or one that's deceiving, and Israel means ruled by God, and yet God loved both of them in both situations. He, he loved Jacob, he chose Jacob while he was Jacob in the flesh, a man of the flesh, and yet he chose Jacob to be ruled by God, and so God loved him no matter what, and God loves us no matter what, whether, in the, whether we're in the flesh or whether we are in the spirit. He loves us. Doesn't mean he likes what we're doing and doesn't mean he approves of it, but he loves us. Just read Romans chapter eight. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, nothing. And so Jesus' first miracle after coming down from the mountain here is that he heals this, this leopard. Uh, you remember back in chapter 
5, verse 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, this leopard was poor in spirit. Literally poor in spirit, if you can only imagine being a leopard and ostracized from the community. So when Jesus came down from the mountain, this great multitude followed him, and people just were drawn to him. Of course, when you uh, hear a man like Jesus, uh, when you see the profound message and authority of Jesus, yeah, you're drawn, drawn to him. Uh, any believer that, that truly surrenders their life to Jesus begins to read the word of God, uh, just wants more of it. Uh, they they want to know more of him because they're drawn to him. And so the multitude are following Jesus down. And this leopard all of a sudden comes along and he throws him down, himself down to worship Jesus there. Probably hearing uh, within the community there that he lived, that Jesus was in town and coming towards Capernaum. And so he took the opportunity to see if Jesus could do something in his own life. So this leopard commits this social taboo because he's not allowed to first enter into town. He's not allowed to come close to other people. In fact, he's supposed to scream out, unclean, unclean, as he's walking around. But he does this anyway. He comes to Jesus. He kneels before Jesus. He acknowledges Jesus with authority and power. He knew that Jesus could heal him, that Jesus could do something. If anyone could make him clean, it was Jesus that could make him clean. What is leprosy? The leprosy is a disease. At one time, it was called responsibility. And it was called responsibility because you, as a leopard, had the responsibility to let people know that you were an unclean vessel. Now, it wasn't necessarily the disease that was, was, was taboo. It was the fact that you were unclean in the eyes of God that was the taboo here. So we need to understand that. That's very important when it comes to the leprosy. Yeah, he wanted to get healed of the leprosy, but more than that, he wanted to be accepted by God because God uh, did not accept him in the eyes of the priest, the people, because he was separated from society itself. And so that's a, a deep emotional stress that's put on an individual. So it's more than just being healed, it's being accepted. It's unfortunate that today, uh, when we do get people that are sick or, or uh, have some great chronic illness, and, and they really are wanting to be healed, but not necessarily restored to God and so oftentimes they go to these healing crusades to be healed and not restored to God and they're doing it the opposite they should desire to be restored to God more than their healing and if healing comes wonderful but at least now I know I'm going to heaven I've been restored in this relationship with Jesus Christ so it was called responsibility it was a loathsome disease here in this context we're not sure what it is whether it is uh, this responsibility or whether it's Hansen's disease. Dr. Hansen isolated uh, the disease and w was able to um, um, not heal it or cure it, but at least create a vaccine that could kind of uh, arrest it to a certain degree. And so n today it's called Hansen's degrees. But we're not sure uh, if he has full-blown or, or, or it's partial, it doesn't say here, but it is enough that the priests consider him unclean. Um, what does leprosy represent in scripture? Spiritually, leprosy represents sin. Sin deteriorates and destroys and ultimately kills you. Leprosy is, does the same thing. It slowly deteriorates your body to the point that eventually you die because organs begin to fail. Uh, it's been known that ears will just all of a sudden fall off, limbs will fall off, fingers will fall off as the disease just eats as your body. And so leprosy oftentimes um, represents sin, sin in the life of a believer. And so the spiritual um, truth that we can draw from here is that in a sense we've all have sinned, fallen short. We've all been in, in a sense separated from God and we need restoration to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a law that pertains to leprosy and we find it in Leviticus and we spoke about that on Wednesday night. The book of Leviticus was the instructions to the priest and how they were to approach the people and the people were to approach God through the priest. They were the mediators of that time. In Leviticus 13 and also verse 3 and verse 46, he talks about the cleansing of a leopard. If the hair of, on a sore had turned white and the sore appeared to be deeper than the skin of the body, it was considered a leprous sore. 
Uh, He is unclean in verse 46, and he shall dwell alone, it says. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. You can also find it in Deuteronomy 24, 8. And this was the prescription of finding somebody with leprosy. How did leprosy affect the people? It was the custom in handling the leprosy at that time to create an area or a camp and this would become the leopard's community, the place where he would dwell with other leopards. And at that time, if they were to leave that camp, as I said earlier, they would come into contact with people. If, if they were coming kind of downwind from that person, then they were supposed to shout out, unclean, unclean, within 150 feet. If they were uh, upwind of that person, it was like 300 feet, they were to let them know because they felt that it could be contagious in, in, a, in a sense. So you can only imagine the loneliness that that leopard probably felt, right? One is that family did not come and visit all the time, but maybe just to bring some resources, left them there at the gate. Uh, They were alone. They were without anyone. Uh, Other fellow leopards probably, um, but felt like they could not enter into the community, could not participate in the temple, could not participate in the Jewish customs and so forth that that, uh, were appropriate in maintaining that relationship with God, the offering up of sacrifices. Uh, On top of that, the emotional stress um, that they probably had endured. And so that's the story here of this leopard of loneliness. There's a story that during the 1995 Chicago experience, a severe uncharacteristic heat wave, uh, which expected heavy tolls, uh, found hundreds of people who had died. Tragically, many who had died there in Chicago had no family or no friends. No one claimed them whatsoever. In fact, 41 people were buried in a massive grave as unknown. No one to grieve them, no one to uh, lay flowers before them. They were just thrown into this grave. That's loneliness. That's loneliness. They say that Americans today that eat dinner alone is about 22% going to dinner and eating alone. I, I don't, that's hard for me to do. I don't know if it's hard for you to do, but you ever go to dinner and eat alone in a restaurant? It, it feels awkward to me to do that. It, it takes a lot to sit there and then you're feeling like people are looking at you because you're all alone and they're with their spouses and so forth. But 22% of people feel alone. I don't know if you feel alone. If you do feel alone, you know, Jesus loves you. And he wants to have a personal relationship with you. And this is what I love about Jesus. He takes people who feel alone and and he becomes their friend. He becomes their God and redeemer. And then he introduces them into the family of God. And then all of a sudden they have a whole new family. Yeah, they might not be blood related, but they are spiritually related. And we create a family. We are a family. Whether you like it or not, you know, we are a family. And what you do What I do affects the family of God. It really does. And we are to live as a family. And that means to love one another, care for one another, be there for one another. And it also means to fight with one another, disagree with one another, uh, throw tantrums with one another, not talk to one another from time to time. That's all family stuff. But we realize we're a family and we're going to stick this out because that's what families do. Nearly a quarter of the nation experiences regular levels of isolation and loneliness. A quarter of the nation, a quarter. There's over 300 million people in, a, in America. So a quarter of that are feeling that loneliness. It was Mother Teresa who said, the most terrifying poverty, poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unwanted. And so this leopard comes and he worships at the feet of Jesus. He, he acknowledges Jesus. He recognizes his power. And he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now there's, there, there's the word of faith right there. When he realizes, Lord, if you, you who I acknowledge as, as God with power and authority are willing, I know that I can be clean. Clean. Now again, The emphasis is upon the restoration of his relationship with society here, not necessarily in the leprosy. 
It's clean in the sense that I can now be reintroduced into society. You can take my condition and you can correct it. What is faith? Because this man had faith. Uh, The leper's faith was faith in Jesus' power to make him clean. Uh, You might have heard this before, but some people in the community will talk about faith on TBN, channel, well, whatever it is today with cable, you never know, 13 today or 14, somewhere around there. It used to be channel 40. When you say channel 40, everybody knew that was TBN. Today, it changes on your cable um, network system, so... But these men talk a lot about faith and having faith, uh, having enough faith that you can change your destiny, whether it's a healing, a miracle, or whether it's financial status. Now, it, it is incredible that this leopard who was diseased would believe that Christ could remove, I mean, this disease because he was going by what he was hearing, what Jesus was doing and what he was saying. And he had enough faith. And of course, the Bible tells us in Romans that the faith comes from God and that God gives us that faith. And he had enough faith to go to Jesus and exercise that. Now, it was Stuart Brosco who said, faith is as valid as its object. The faith teachers will tell you, if you have faith in your faith, then you can get things done. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Because faith doesn't get things done. It's who you have faith in that gets things done. If you have faith in your faith, if you have faith in yourself, if you have faith in the church, if you have faith in man, if you have faith in the government, uh, you, you don't know if it's going to get done or not. It's only by as much power as they have and authority. And it's very limited. To have faith in faith, nothing will get done. What you're saying is, my faith is so strong that I'm actually the one doing it because of my faith, and that's not true. But to have faith in Jesus, now that's power, and that's authority, because Jesus has all power and authority. He created the heavens and the earth, and everything that existed. He divided the waters. He brought manna down from heaven. Uh, He's the one that's going to heal the leopard, heal the servant of the centurion. Jesus walked on water. That's power. That's the power and the resources that we need to go to is to Jesus himself. You can have tremendous faith in faith, but very thin ice and you'll drown. Or you can have very little faith in very thick ice and not drown. I like what George Mueller said. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible, though. It, ra- it operates in the realm of the impossible. You can have faith that, that your job will take care of you. And that makes perfect sense. But having faith when you lose your job that God will take care of you now that's power because your job will take care of you it's run by men and you're working for men and there's a certain responsibility that they have to pay you on a regular basis so that you can supply the needs of your family but when you have nothing and no one is hiring you how is God going to supply your needs that's having faith in God and then God pulls through and he supplies your needs And that's when it becomes a miracle and we need to make sure that we glorify God in doing that because there's no glory for God in in that which is humanly possible. If there's a a, a percent of human involvement, then there's no glory for God. That's why building the church is so important that we realize that it's not us who builds the church, it's God who builds the church. And he's very clear in telling us that in Acts chapter 2. It's the Lord who adds to the church daily. It's our responsibility to share the gospel, to share, to plant seeds and to water, but the Lord gives the increase. And so to have faith more than anything else, not in me, not in you, but have faith in God. And so our prayers should be, Lord, you add to our church. You bring people, you bring men that are committed, that have a desire and a hunger to serve you, that understand the scriptures, and that want to apply them to their lives. Bring women that have the same drive, the same love as their husbands, that desire to do a work for the kingdom of God. And these are the things that we should be praying by faith to God that he would do. And faith begins where man's power ends. So when all hope is lost in man's way, why not come to the feet of Jesus, worship him, because he is more than willing. So Jesus put out his hand and touched him and said, I'm willing, be 
cleansed. And so immediately the leprosy left him. He was cleansed, which again demonstrates Jesus' authority over sickness and disease. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one. I like that. Simple command. Tell no one. Go your way. Show yourself to the priest, which was his responsibility uh, to do so. He was supposed to give a gift to the priest, uh, like in the Levitical law, and it was usually a turtle dove if you were poor. If you were well off, then it was a sacrifice of a lamb and some flour and other things that you were to give to them. But the testimony was to show them that you are healed and you're healed by God and you're giving a sacrifice unto the Lord, giving him glory for it. You can find that in Leviticus 14. Now it's interesting though that that this testimony, because it was a testimony to them, who's them? The priest. And so this man obviously didn't obey Jesus. <laughs> he was so excited that he, on his way to Jerusalem, because he had to go to Jerusalem to offer up this gift and let the priest know that he's been cleaned. And on and, and his way there, he's telling everybody, Jesus healed me. I used to be a leopard, I'm now a leopard no more. I, I used to be in a camp, I'm not in the camp no more. I used to have to scream out, unclean, unclean. Now I can just rejoice like everyone else. And he's just telling people all along the way. And this is how the crowds began to grow around Jesus. Because men like him didn't obey him when it came to proclaiming uh, the good news of Jesus in their lives. Uh, We should be like that man. We should be proclaiming it to our neighbors and our friends. We should be inviting them to church. We should be uh, kneeling down with them and praying with them and and introducing them to Jesus Christ. Now the next healing is the healing of a centurion uh, servant. We're not going to read the whole thing because we just don't have the time. And As I said, it's a lot of scriptures for 45 minutes. Um, This healing is a healing of a slave, a slave of a centurion who um, is a Gentile. And that's the significance of this healing. Not just that it was the faith of this Gentile for someone else, but the fact that he is a Gentile. This is the beginning of Jesus introducing the gospel to the Gentile nation. Uh, We find that he extends his mercies and grace, not just to Israel, but also to the rest of the world, the Gentile nation. The, the word Gentile itself, it, it's a Latin word. It's not a Greek word. The Greek word is nations and people other than the Jews. That's all it is. So when it says Gentiles, it's everyone else that isn't a Jew. That's all Gentile means. And so the gospel is going to the Gentiles and he begins by healing the servant of this centurion soldier. Now, back in chapter 5, Jesus told the disciples, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And this centurion soldier, which is interesting, he mourned for his servant. Uh, I find that more employers should mourn for their employees. They should love their employees. They should take care of their employees. Peter spent some time there uh, with bosses masters and servants and how they should take care of their employees and not have this callous cold relationship we have to let you go because it's business don't take it personal well i take it personal because i can't feed my family because i can't t- pay my bills and so it is personal to me and that's a famous phrase that we battle with in our society you've heard that phrase before haven't you you've probably heard it in movies too you know and then the guy says but i do take it personal and then he blows the guy away you know <laughs> and so you you see it happening in society but i think god has the answer is that if servants were to work hard for their bosses and if bosses were to to respect and, and love their servants, that they could actually produce something great and get along and be a great example. Uh, it's just a, a testimony of God's love in a life of an individual here. So Jesus comforts this centurion soldier. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, and Percurnium, Percurnium, Percur, per Procurnium, uh, I can't say it right now, <clears throat> becomes Jesus' city. It becomes his hub. And he will then work from that place going out to different areas. And so the centurion comes to him, which was a Roman military officer who commanded about 100 men. An officer served his entire 
life as a soldier for the Roman government. Uh, it was F.D. Uh, Gailey who said the centurions were actual working officers, the backbone of the army. So this guy totally understood authority. He understood work. He understood uh, the power of an army, the power of authority. He understood all of those things. It does not say if the centurion became a Christian here, it just says that he came to Christ on behalf of this servant of his. We know later on in Acts chapter 10 that there was another centurion, Cornelius, who did become a Christian with his family. I wonder why this centurion didn't go to his doctor or to his leader or even request the physicians of, of Caesar himself. But he goes to Jesus so it doesn't say, but you have to wonder how he heard about Jesus, whether his servants were talking about it or whether he heard the commotions and they were sent out because there were insurrections that were taking place, you know, with Herod and, and so forth. You remember Herod trying to kill Jesus at the age of two, maybe at that time, you know, there's a king that's born and then all of a sudden they're hearing about a king and Jesus giving you a sermon on the mount. So he heard this somewhere. And he realizes that Jesus has some sort of power and authority. And he has this command. And when he commands something, it's done. And this centurion soldier understands that completely. So he doesn't go to his, his own presidential statements for help or so forth. He goes to Jesus. And we all should go to Jesus first. No matter what, we should always seek Jesus first. Even before you come to me, go to Jesus. Ask him to help you ask him to direct you ask him to heal you you can have many healings in your own family little healing services you know and just pray over and anoint people your children and your family with oil and ask the lord to bring healings as long as you glorify him don't take any glory at all give it all to him but this centurion pleads with him a strong urge a begging you know come please help my servant is ill and I am begging you to come over. And he says, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. The word servant is boy in the Greek. And so when he says servant, it's a servant boy. So this is a young man. This is possibly even a child who's serving him. Maybe the child of another servant that has been faithful for many years. And he's got this bond and this connection. And so he says, this guy's laying in bed. He, 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 in fact, the word laying means throwing. They had to literally pick him up and toss him into the bed because he can't move. He's so sick and he's paralyzed. He's tormented. He's dreadfully tormented in, in a sense because of the depth of the pain that's going on in his body. Now, if you've never suffered pain like that, you don't know what tormented pain is. I have. If you ever get to, and I don't suggest trying it, but if you ever have your sciatic nerve crushed, there is a lot of pain there. It is excruciating pain um, that just... It's so overwhelming that you can't even cry out. You just shed tears. And I've been there. I didn't understand that there was a scale. We have a scale of, to measure pain levels. And the way that they measure pain levels is by uh, the, the pain in your body and how you're feeling and your face expressions. And so they created these little cartoons with face expressions and so if you're in pain they say well what number from one to ten of pain do you have and they show you a cartoon if you're smiling like this then it's zero and it says well if you're like this you know with a face expression without really a smile then you're probably one or two if you're like okay a little sad like oh then you're probably four or five now if you're kind of like this walking around you're probably six but if you're like, uh, and tears are coming out, you're like 10, you know, and I didn't realize that. I thought this was probably like five or four. And so I said, I'm that one right there. You're a 10. You're at the top of the scale. I'm like, really? I didn't realize that. That's when you're in dreadful torment, when your sciatic nerve gets squeezed and, and you don't even want to move. You find a spot that just feels good and it's not hurting you're like don't move me and i'll lay here for hours hours just to not feel that pain the depth of this pain is amazing that this boy was suffering being paralyzed 
And so he brings Jesus this disabled, weak um, <clears throat> request of a boy uh, that he would heal him. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the word I there again is emphatic. So Jesus is saying, I will. And so it, it was a command with authority that he is going to come and heal that boy. And of course, the centurion answers and says, Lord, or master. Uh, and now he's humbling himself. He's surrendering to him, giving him authority. Lord, master, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. There is the realization of your unworthiness right there. I am unworthy for you to come under my roof. Now, as a centurion soldier, you have to have a positive attitude. You have to have authority. Uh, you're commanding a legion. You're commanding men. For you to show weakness whatsoever, you know, w would not be a, an advantage to you, especially on your man's side. And so you never would do that. Oh, we can do it. You know, don't dare come to my house. You're just a subordinate. I am the leader. You know, you have boundaries. You have lines. You dare not cross that line. But here he says, Master, I'm not even worthy for you to come to my home. How many men have felt that when Jesus calls them? I'm not worthy. What have I done to be so unworthy? The men that I have hurt, the women that I've hurt, the words that I've said, the sin that I've committed against God, the destruction that I've done in people's lives, what I've taken from them that, that wasn't mine to take, what I've caused them to go through. Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy for you to even come into my home. I'm so dirty. I'm so unclean. Lord, there's just no way that I even ask you to come over to my house. If you have a messy house, you know what I mean. You don't want people coming over. Oh, no, no, they're going to see the messy house. Don't, don't invite them. Why did you invite them? What's wrong with you? I didn't even have time to clean the house. You know, totally, totally understand. That's how we felt. Oh, no, Jesus, don't come to my house. <laughs> I'm a Gentile centurion soldier. No, no, I'm not even a Jew. And you want to come to my house? Please don't do that. Only speak the word. Ah, here we go. Just speak a word, Lord, a statement of faith here. Just speak the word, Jesus. Notice he didn't say, on my faith, Jesus, heal him. No, he didn't say that. Or on his faith, Jesus. No, just, Jesus, you just speak the word because I know that you can. He expresses belief, not only in Jesus' authority over sickness and disease, but also over time and space. You don't even have to come to my house. You don't even have to be there to lay a hand on him. If you just speak it, I know it will be done. Same is true today. Jesus doesn't have to come down and visit us. All we have to do is ask, and if it's his will, he'll heal us. Doesn't have to be here. I know my servant will be healed, he said. He felt unworthy, and this is exactly where God wants us. He wants us in a place where we feel unworthy. It was layman commentator who said I am no better than a thief a prostitute or an adulterer but in the same way that I resist adultery in the name of Jesus I can appeal to my savior in time of need I like the example that Rich gave us the other day of a chart it says if we were to measure all our our sins you know just let's just put it on the screen there and we put all our names at the bottom and we have a little flow chart and, and maybe we will see a little push up there and we'll say one through a million sins right and some of us might be you know maybe up a little bit and the others might be way up there you know and the others might be halfway and we're like okay I can see who really is the sinner right there oh boy look at that guy's up to a million there and the other ones are down at 500 you know so forth and that's our view that's our view we're all sinners but you know God's view if you turn that graph upside down he doesn't see anything it's all going down you're all sinners. That's all he sees. You're all sinners. Every one of us are sinners. It was Martin Luther who said, if all thieves were to be hanged from a gallow, the world would soon be desolate and would be without both executioner and gallows. <laughs> right? Because we're all guilty. We're all 
guilty. If Christ had to come to this earth, if you were the only man, the only man, he would still come for you. And you'd have to be the one to crucify him on the cross for your sins, for your sins. No, we're all unworthy, guys. Oh, how we need to understand that when we make our judgment calls on one another. Oh, I totally get that completely. That we're all sinners. We all fail God. And we need to be patient with one another. Notice what the man says in verse 9. For I, and it's an emphatic in the Greek again. He's just emphasizing himself. Uh, he's already humbled himself and realized he's not worthy. But he says, but I also am a man under authority. Having a soldier under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes. And to another, come. And he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. So he totally gets authority. And, and that's authority. And that should be authority. That's how authority works. Not in our day and age, though, does it? We buck authority. We don't like authority. We'll fight against authority. Um, the boss says, do this. And we're like, well, why do I have to do that? No, no, no. Will you work for me? <laughs> this is my business. I'll do it the way I want to do it. And as long as I'm paying your check at the end of the month and signing it, you're under my authority. Simple as that. Oh, but well, then go get another job, right? That's how it should work. He understood that. And he understood it is a principle throughout life. And it should be followed, whether in church or outside of church. God is our authority. And then Moses. And Moses chose men to take his lead, to obey his commands, and to get things done. Jesus did the same thing. See, the centurion was a commander, but he had commanders over him just as well. He had authority but others exercised great authority over him than he did. So even he was under authority by Caesar himself. See, all authority in the army was what? Vested in who? The emperor. He was the main man. He was the one that was really in charge. So that the centurion was subject to the imperial authority. That's where he ultimately got his authority was from Caesar himself. So he represents who? Caesar. And when he goes to his men, it's as though Caesar's standing there and he's commanding his men to go forth. Same is true with us. You know, I was in a class years ago, years ago, and it was on the gifts of the Spirit and this teacher was there. And um, he was, the first thing he said was, I want you to know that what I'm going to teach you is not my opinion. It is Pastor Chuck's opinion. And what I'm going to teach you is what Pastor Chuck would teach you if he was standing right here. Because I am an ambassador of Pastor Chuck. This is his ministry and the work of what God is doing in his life. And so I represent Pastor Chuck as though he was standing here himself. And so what I'm going to share with you is what Pastor Chuck would share with you himself. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, wow, this guy totally gets it, totally gets it. That's what the centurion is saying here. See, when the centurion gave an order, he obeyed. He was obeyed because he spoke with the authority of the emperor. And they knew <laughs> if you disobey the centurion, you're disobeying the emperor. So this, re this man's re rely reply shows that he had an unusual understanding that Jesus also spoke with the authority of God. See, so he's going to Jesus saying, I understand authority. Even you are under authority of your father. And there's power there from God. So he acknowledged that Jesus was the son of God and that his power came from his father in heaven and he had all authority. So when Jesus heard that, he just <laughs> marveled, it says. He was blown away that this Gentile got it more than the Jews. He said to those who followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such faith or greater faith, not even in Israel itself. In all of the world, 
of the Jewish nation, this Gentile had greater faith than them. Amazing. It blew him away. Of course, the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. And the centurion got that completely as he came to Jesus. And so Jesus was well pleased, well pleased with the centurion. And he, and he says to you that many will come from the east, verse 11, and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. And this is where he includes the Gentiles. He says, because of this man's faith is an example of his acceptance of me as the Messiah, that in the future, many Gentiles will come and sit with your forefathers, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, including this centurion soldier. And you can find that in Psalms 107, uh, Isaiah 49, and Malachi uh, 111. So he's talking about the gathering of the nations and the gathering of the nations at the second coming of Christ when they sit down to sup with the Lamb of God. This is prophetic. And he's giving uh, us a picture of that time when Jesus will come back and the marriage of the lamb will take place, Revelation 9, 19. But then he says in verse 12, but the son, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into our darkness. The consequences of unbelief for the Jewish nation. The Jews that do not believe who were sons will be cast out into utter darkness. That is hell. That's the implication there. Hell itself. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth the word weeping there you get the idea of uh, of crying loudly but there's more of a cry of rejection so what the leopard felt while on earth will be what the jews feel eternally in hell separated from god completely isolated no one to touch and they will be weeping and grinding their teeth because of their rejection of the Messiah. They will totally understand and know. That is truly hell itself. And Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, as you have believed, so let it be done to you. And so the boy was healed, just as he said. Your servant was healed that same hour. Let me close little story that I, I read and I thought it was pretty interesting about a president, Dwight Eisenhower. He had a distinction of being the only American president to have been baptized and received into the church membership under confession of faith while in office. Dwight Eisenhower, I didn't know that about him. He received the Lord Jesus Christ into his life. And while in his office, he confessed Jesus. When he passed away, the memorial service in the Washington Cathedral witnessed strongly of his faith. There could be no mistake that he loved the Lord. The simple service, it says, the hymns, the songs by the choir, the congregation, the scripture reading, the prayers, given even the apostles' creeds, all bore witness that Ike, Ike's faith was in his Lord. The leaders of 100 nations were present and they heard the witness. More than that, national TV brought the witness before American people. We were not only reminded of Eisenhower's faith, but of his humility. There might have been much celebrating, pomp, uh, huge ceremony with trumpets and men marching and so forth. But Eisenhower was the commander of an allied force for the invasion of Europe. And he was one of the world's most decorated military men. Many honors had been heaped upon him in life and death uh, and service in his service. And it says that when... They planned his burial that he desired to be buried in a regular casket as a common soldier. And so that's what they did, which speaks of his humility. And so though he was a great man, he was a humble man. First step to salvation is our humility. First step to healing is our humility, that we can't do it. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he promises that he will lift you up. I want to give you an opportunity. I like to give opportunities, especially when we're going through the Bible and we come to scriptures of healings for the Lord to just do a healing. And so as I close in prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand up if you would desire a healing and we're going to pray for you. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. 
There's power there. Now we understand, Lord, that, that Jesus needed to do these miracles at these times. And in the context to show the rest of the world that he is the Messiah and that he has all authority and power to do so. And as time went by through the apostles, healings kind of diminished a little bit, Lord. Not that they weren't there or they were done away with, but Lord, Jesus already came. He died. He resurrected. He ascended into heaven. And so now we are to receive him by faith that he is who he said he was. And we have the evidence by looking back at the healings and the power and authority. But Lord, you do still heal. And so we're asking you to visit us today, Lord. If it's my faith, then then great, Lord. If it's the faith of someone here, Lord, then wonderful. If it's the faith of the person that needs the healing, Lord, let it just be there, Father. But we also know because we want to get the context of the scriptures that we know it's according to your will. We know that you're working things out in each one of our lives and there's a purpose for us to go through suffering. If anything, that we know the suffering is of Christ. Or maybe we can minister to others who are suffering. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that. But, Lord, if we need the faith, and like that man with that young child of his who came to you and said, Lord, help my unbelief, then help us also, Lord, right now. And so, Lord, please, we're inviting you here. We're begging you like that centurion soldier, Lord. We're asking that you restore us, Father, like that leper, Lord, with a healing, Father, with a touch that you would be willing, Lord, to do so, Lord. And we're praying this, Father, with all our heart, in Jesus' name. So if you need a healing, I want you just to stand up. Thank you, Lord. Hey, God heals small, and he also heals big. It's not small or big to him. And so if you need a healing, just stand up. And let the Lord heal you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, Lord. Father. Okay, now, if you're close by, I want you to just to put your hand on that person's shoulder. And just, um, we're going to pray. And I, I like doing that so that it's not me, the one healing. But it might be you. It might be the child that's doing it. Because child's have wonderful faith so put your hands on on those next to you father we come before you in the name of jesus and by his power and his authority lord because we know he too is under authority lord we know that he's god in the flesh we know that he gave us the evidence by many healings in the gospels and so lord we know that he is able more than able lord to heal And so, Father, whether we're here now or, or Lord, maybe there's someone that we know that needs a healing, and they're not here, and so we're asking for them too, Lord. I think of Mario, Father, who's at home right now and hasn't been to church in a while, who has lung problems. We're asking you to heal in the name of Jesus, Lord. If it is your will, Lord, heal us. Heal him and heal those that we know aren't here, Lord. And we're believing in your healing, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and we'll finish off with this song. Standing here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done, waiting here patiently just to hear your still small again holy righteous faithful till the end savior healer redeemer and friend i will worship you for who you are i will worship you for who you are I will
God bless you.